And I think we made it work. I believe so. I believe so. All right, good. Um, I believe everything worked the way it was supposed to. Um, in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, that last night it told me I... Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, hi. <laughs> good evening. I'm Tad. It's Sunday. Um, it is 7 o'clock, well, 7.01, actually, here in California. Um, I am going to be reading. I am, as you can see, I am, whoops, I'm always confused by this. I am cat sitting, as usual. There is a large, I always get the side wrong. There is a large, round, orange cat there in the background. Um, and I think everything should be working properly tonight, including, I hope, the volume. Somebody asked about the volume last night, um, and I've cranked it up a tiny bit, but I hope that if that is insufficient, people will let me know. Um, let me think. Anything else I needed to mention? No. I, as I said, just, you know, let me know um, if anything has gone strangely and uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, in the meantime, we will just go ahead as though everything is working the way it's supposed to. I've uh, been cracking along on the book. Um, now, as I mentioned last night at some kind of uh, meandery length, I'm, I got past a couple of crucial bits that were really bugging me, um, mostly logistics, mostly blocking, blocking out scenes. Um, I was talking at some length about that and about how it is very much analogous to theater, at least for me. Um, I'm sure with all writers that they have their own frame of reference for things as to how they work. And as I've said in the past, a lot of my stuff is, um, first of all, it's, it's musically oriented, or at least that's how I tend to think of it. Um, I feel things rhythmically and thematically uh, that, you know, I'll help to determine how I write. Um, what I mean by that is, say, for instance, I will be working on a certain bit and say, this feels like the pace needs to come up um, uh, or like I need to uh, reiterate a theme, um, you know, whether that be a symbolic theme or a syntactical theme, um, you know, in other words, how I'm writing. Um, but also, and this is what I was talking about last night, when I am putting together a scene or I'm thinking about what's going to happen, I, I know in a very general sense, usually always before I start it, um, a lot of the things that I want to have happen, what I don't know exactly is how the physical action, um, whatever it might be, is going to take place. Uh, so, you know, again, like theater, I have to set the scene, I have to block the scene, I have to think about where the characters are physically, well, first geographically, um, but then where they actually are, you know, in relationship to each other, what their different motivations are and things like that. So I was working through a scene that was very difficult for me and uh, managed to uh, finally solve it, um, in part thanks to Deb, because I was talking to her and she made a couple of suggestions that although I didn't specifically use them, it, it did what I hoped it would do, which is it sprang me off thinking in some other directions. Um, it's remarkable sometimes what a very small thing is is necessary to give you a, a give the writer give me a, 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 a different look at something um, and oftentimes I will spend literally several hours just kind of agonizing over something and worrying about it and trying to figure out a way to do it and feeling as though I have exhausted every possible way of doing something and then one tiny little thing I'll think about, well, what if just did that differently? Or what if I turned that character around? Or what if so-and-so was present instead? And that little small thing will just suddenly click the whole thing into place and I will have a solution to whatever was bothering me. Um, this, by the way, is one of the reasons that I don't personally believe in writer's block. And I've said this before, so forgive me if I'm, I'm preaching to the choir to people who've already heard this many times, but I do believe a lot of what people think of as writer's block, or at least 
people who are trying to write think of as writer's block is more to do with crisis of confidence um, in the sense that I think that certainly coming to a stop every now and then and saying, I don't really know how to go forward is actually part of the process. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a bug. It, it's, you know, it's actually part of what you're supposed to be doing. Um, it, it's a feature. And sometimes you just aren't ready, you know, and especially when you're working on a big complicated thing and you've got a lot of information that you're trying to sort into some kind of manageable uh, order and sense and trying to work with many different plots and characters and all that stuff. And there are times when you have a map in your head of what's going to happen and you get to a certain point and you realize that map is no longer completely valid. This is not how I pictured it was going to be and therefore I can't just go forward. Um, but that's, that's you know, as I said, I think that's actually, sorry, I'm struggling with a cord underneath my keyboard here. Um, that's, for me anyway, that actually is just part of the process. There are times when you're just not ready to do certain kinds of things. And as a result, um, instead of trying to force your way through and feeling inadequate or, you know, like a failure because you can't make it happen right that second, it's usually just your subconscious saying, slow down, not ready for this yet. We have to rethink this. We have to come at this a different way or whatever. So I don't tend to get too upset when those kinds of things happen. Um, and you know, the sheer volume of stuff that I've written over the years suggests that I'm, you know, I am actually getting writing done. So that helps too. That's always a, you know, a, a source of, of reassurance. It's like, yeah, I've done this before. I've finished these stories. I've, you know, written books. So, you know, I probably don't have to worry too much. Um, but it took me, you know, I, on the way to get to that, I had to believe that I was doing it the right way. So it, it's not only because I've done it before. It's also because it, it, it makes sense to me that I'm not always ready to write something at the moment that I literally arrive at that point in the story. And sometimes I just have to walk away, carry it around in my head, as I mentioned, try different things, reblock it, um, you know, say maybe uh, I just have to skip this scene for now. I'll just make a note about what probably will happen and then go write something else instead or, you know, work on a completely different story sometimes. So all of these things I think are, are you know, important to keep one moving forward, but also understanding that it, relentless forward progress is not always possible. It's, a, it's not an exact science. It's not, you know, it's not carpentry. You know, it, it's something more strange and, and complicated than that. And sometimes you just have to say, well, not yet. I'll get to it. Um, anyway, let me say hello to people and then I can start reading. So glad to see everybody's here. It looks like we have managed to make contact through the ether. Um, so I'm glad we solved that problem. Um, Medardo, hello, hello, hello. Uh, last Sunday you came, but your comment remained in the first discarded transmission. Ah, okay. Um, anyway, so lovely that you're here and able to, to openly comment. Claudia, good evening, good evening, good evening. Lori, good evening. How is my dad? Dad's doing okay. I'm going to go stay with him on Tuesday, so I will have more... Uh, information uh, than what I have at the moment, although obviously my brothers and I, as we take turns, are all staying in touch. But um, I think dad's generally go doing pretty well. We're trying to, he doesn't want to stay in in our, in my parents' house, um, quite understandably. It's a big house now and his mobility is not great. So he's looking into other places to live in terms of a, a more long-term solution. So we're working with him on that. My brothers have been Working very hard, I have to say. They have been really, really good about um, working with them on, on all of this stuff, uh, including various legal and insurance things and all that kind of stuff. So uh, he's doing okay under the circumstances. It's obviously, you know, when you lose your partner of 60 plus years, it's a huge deal. Um, but it's always hard to tell. My dad is a science guy. 
Um, I've, I've teased about that before, um, most notably in the other land dedications. Um, so it's sometimes a little hard to tell what exactly is going on inside the dad head. Um, he is not as forthcoming conversationally as the rest of us. In fact, the rest of us are more like me, which, you know, is more like my mom, um, which is we all hurry to offer information. Maybe me the most, but all, all of the, the, the siblings were all pretty chatty. Um, Dad is not that way. And in fact, it's sometimes this is a source of frustration. First, it used to be for my mom and, and, and even is for us sometimes. It's kind of like, what is dad thinking? And you ask him and you get these kind of noncommittal responses. Um, but anyway, so thank you for asking after him. I think he's doing as well as can be expected in the circumstances. Kelly, you're back. Did I miss you? Of course we missed you. Of course we did. Good to have you. Penny, hello. Good to see you. Isaac, checking in from Utah. Yes, I was right about Utah. Okay. The mountains of Utah. Ooh, I'm sure it's pre very pretty. Um, Deborah is, is keen to get to, uh, is it Monument Valley? So one of these days, we will probably be wandering over there to see um, Monument Valley and some of those parts of Utah. Winter, hello, hello. Yes, the family... We're doing well. Uh, I just heard from my daughter, our daughter, and uh, she and her partner are the ones who moved out north this summer, and they are undergoing the heartbreak of parenthood because they've adopted two cats, and they just discovered that the cats have learned how to get into the, the kittens, have learned how to get into the cat food at night when, they're, when the uh, humans are asleep. So <laughs> I, there is a certain schadenfreude that is involved here in the sense of I think all parents know that when their own kids become parents that you you hear a lot of things about how difficult adulthood is that make you smile and go yeah we were trying to tell you that all those years it's tough being a parent whether of cats dogs children doesn't matter anyway um so they seem to be well the other two young people are still living with us here and they're doing as well as can be expected too so thank you for asking winner good to see you Kristen. hello good i'm glad you got notified this time should be notified through the regular tad page also i think i rearranged all of that stuff so it should work properly again <clears throat> excuse me barban hello good evening Hope you are well too. Jared, hello. Thank you for the love and kindness. Much appreciated. Ron, hello buddy. Good to see you. Emily, oh yes, report from your first guest of honor at ConCon, CanCon, sorry. Well, it was awesome. Did a micro fiction party event and the next day someone told me his life was changed and he can now write again because he finally saw his inner critic blocking him. Excellent. This happens every time I do this event, says Emily. Um, I met wonderful people and gave my first con speech, and Julie Cherneda asked me to sign her book also because I was the editor. I know Julie. Julie's a sweetie. Excellent. 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 Sounds like a very good con experience and especially a very good GOH experience. I'm really happy for you, Emily. Excellent. Melissa, good evening. Good to see you. I like the exclamation point. Makes it even better, more exciting. Soren, good evening. Um, wondering if now that you were, Soren is asking if uh, now that I'm reading my work from so long ago, if any re regrets or mistakes from MSNT are rearing their heads. Well, <coughs> excuse me. It, it depends on how narrowly um, we are f calling things mistakes or regrets. It is inevitable. Even if something I wrote half a year ago or a few days ago or even earlier today, although usually I consider that to be well within the correction cycle. But, you know, I, I can't reread almost anything of mine without seeing something that I at least want to think about changing. So that, and as I said, that's true even with things I've literally just written, you know, just finished, just edited, put them aside. Two days later, I look at them and I see things that I want to change. However, again, any professional writer knows that 
a story is never really finished, you know, in the sense that you could always find something to change, even if you're just sort of rearranging deck chairs, you know, you're just moving things around a little bit. You're just saying, oh, uh, that could be a little more terse. And then you adjust that and you realize the, the meter of the lines is now a little out of out of whack. And so because that line is now shorter, you kind of have to make this line a little shorter also, um, that kind of stuff. So that's always possible. There aren't many major things that I see, fortunately. Um, and I did have to reread Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn before I started the new series, which was literally the first time I had read the books as books um, ever. And certainly the last, the first time I had read any major chunk of any of those books in 20 something years. So I did have that experience then. And I don't remember specifically thinking, oh, I would have changed that. Oh, I would have changed that. I saw a couple little things where I realized that, yeah, I, I don't like that as much as I did when I was writing it. Um, but generally, no. And again, I think that's part of who I am as a writer, which is that I am very conscious of the fact that I will change as I go and that I am... I don't want to say growing as a writer. I'd like to think so, but I'm certainly changing as a writer um, as my years of writing have progressed. And so I will always approach things slightly differently than I would have when I originally did them. But that feels perfectly normal to me and doesn't feel like it's the difference between right and wrong. It feels like the difference between now and then. Um, and therefore, I'm able to look at stuff that I've already written with a certain degree of uh, remoteness or, you know, removal, or I, I can't think of the word I want right at the moment, but distance, perspective, you know? Um, so I don't look at it and go, oh my God, that's awful. Um, I look at it and say, eh, I'd probably do that differently if I were writing this now. But the other good thing is these books are done. You know, they're done, they've been out, they've been in print. You know, uh, the Dragonbone Chair has been in print continuously since 1985, which is a long time now. Uh, or No, 88. 88, sorry, Tail Chaser song was 85. Since 88, you know. And obviously people at least seem to have gotten something out of it. So it's not like I'm going, why did this fail? Um so I can be fairly calm about the whole thing and, you know, a bit distant and, you know, just go, hey, that's, I wrote that. That's pretty interesting. Um, without having to feel like, you know, oh, now I could make it perfect because there is no perfect. There really isn't. And that's why you're never really finished with a book. You just decide that you're going to leave it alone. And that's a, that's a skill that has to be learned. It's a crucial skill for a, a professional writer, for somebody who's actually writing books to make a living, you got to finish a book and turn it in before it can be published. And until it gets published, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to sell it to people. So, um, you know, you, you have to be able to say, okay, enough is enough. Stop diddling with things. Anyway, uh, let me see who else have I said. I said hello to, yeah, I said hello to Melissa. I did. Jim, hello. Good to see you. Lori, Yes, company. That is, that is, uh, there's always company. There is the stuffed gorilla and the slightly stuffed cat. Mm, hey, are you an angst? Hey, are you an angst? I am watching you. There's Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Timothy, blasting five alarm funk, writing grant applications and getting squirrely for the mi by the minute. Yeah, hey, I'm all for squirrely. Um, all is good and yeah, relatively tidy. Actually, you can look, the office is a bit tidier than usual because I've been doing some picking up. Ray, greetings. Good to see you. Susan, hello from North Carolina. Good to have you. Thank you. Some of my very closest friends live in North Carolina, actually, in Raleigh, Durham, um, because uh, one of them teaches at UNC. Tracy, hello, hello. Um, I'm very happy that my my sharing information about how I set up scenes is useful. I, I, I try, I, I figure there must be some people who are interested in that kind of stuff. So um, if not, people will let me know and I will quit doing it. But people seem to be interested. Jeremy, hello, fully awake this time. Excellent. 
And oh, good. Nice that you had a good musical time too. David, hello, hello. Just finished giving a lecture in time to tune in. Excellent, nice to have you. Tim, good evening. And all of your TAD friends, well, they all say hello. I hope everyone had a great week, so do I. Angie, hello, hello. And Angie thinks I'm all kinds of awesome. I'm not, but I'm willing to let people believe that. And that's okay with me. Felina, hello, hello. It's like a in real life podcast. It is. Um, 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 David. I said David. David. David already said David. David has eight cats. Reminds me, the very first fan letter I ever got, ever, was when Tail Chaser was printed again back in 1985 or published, and I got my very first fan letter, and I was so excited. And this is in the old days when, you know, there was only letters and there were actual letters written on paper. And I opened it up and it said, you know, basically, we loved your book. Um, you know, we have 17 cats. And I said, wonderful. My very first fan letter is from a crazy person. <laughs> okay, who else? Becky, hello. Yes, I'm going to be reading in just a moment. Uh, Anthony, hello. Good to see you. Nice. Checking in from San Diego. And okay. Oh, and now I've just found out what part of Utah that Isaac lives in, which is the Cache Valley or Cache Valley, depending on how you pronounce it, um, in the border near Idaho and Wyoming. Uh -huh. um, who is snoozing in the background? That is Lily. Lily Vanilli. Um, which is, as I think I've mentioned before, is one of the many nicknames for our large round office cat. Um, I call her Lily Vanilli because she looks like two German men might be hiding inside of her. Uh, <laughs> Chris, hello. Good to see you. Rose, Rose Wilderness. I love that name. That is such a good name. Uh, and David admits that, even David admits that 17 is, is an insane number of cats. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Okay, so I have wasted a huge amount of time, as I oftentimes do, or, well, maybe some people don't think it's wasted, but obviously when it comes to the sheer amount of reading, uh, I have not been very good about getting my reading in every night at, at such length as would be possible within the hour if I did all the reading I should. But I do get talking. And that's just a fact. And I don't know if I can apologize for that enough. <coughs> I also apologize for making all these weird raspy noises. Um, but it's just the way things are at the moment. It's damp. It's damp here today. Anyway, so we are with Simon and Binibic in the midst of chapter 24, The Hounds of Urkenland, and Simon and Binibic. Binibic has just been reading to Simon from Morganes' manuscript, which is a life of King John. And Simon has just learned some hard lessons about King John's approach to kingship and honor. And that's where we were. So I am starting another part. So Binibic and Simon are heading into the Aldhort Forest because they no longer feel safe out on the plains where the Buchan attacked them and where uh, various other things have happened. So that's what's going on. Binibic had certainly been right about one thing. As they crested the hill, they could see virtually nothing but the great dark sweep of Aldhort stretching illimitably before them, a green and black ocean frozen a moment before its waves crashed at the feet of the hills. Old Heart, however, looked like a sea that the land itself might break against and fail. Simon could not help sucking in a deep breath of wonderment. The trees rolled off and away into the distance until the mist swallowed them, as if the forest might somehow pass beyond the very boundaries of the earth. Binibic, seeing him staring, said, Of all times when it is important to be listening to me, this will be it. If we lose each other out there, there may be no finding again. I was in the forest before, Binibek. The fringes only, friend Simon. Now we are going deeply in. All the way through? 
No, that would take months, a year, who is knowing? But we are going far past her borders, so we must hope we are permitted guests. As Simon stared down, he felt his skin tingle. The dark, silent trees, the shadowy pathways that had never known the sound of a footfall, all the stories of a town and castle dwelling people were just at the fringes of his imagination and all too easy to summon. But I must go, he told himself. And anyway, I, I don't think the forest is evil. It's just old, very old, and suspicious of strangers. Or at least it makes me feel that way, but not evil. Let's go, he said in his clearest, strongest voice. But as Binibic started down the hill before him, Simon made the sign of the tree on his breast, just to be on the safe side of things. They had made their way down the hill and onto a, the league of grassy downs that sloped to Aldhort's edge when Kantaka suddenly stopped, shaggy head cocked to one side. The sun was high in the sky now, past noon, and much of the ground-hugging mist had burned away. As Simon and the troll walked toward the wolf, who crouched motionless as a gray statue, they looked all around. No movement broke the land's static undulation on either side. Kantaka whined as they approached and tilted her head to the other side, listening. Binibic gently lowered his shoulder bag to the ground, stilling the quiet clinking of the bones and stones inside, then cocked an ear himself. The troll opened his mouth to say something, his hair hanging lank in his eyes, but before he spoke, Simon heard it too, a thin, faint noise rising and falling as though a flight of honking geese were passing leagues overhead, far above the clouds. But it did not seem to come from the sky above, Rather, it sounded as though it rolled down the long corridor between the forest and the hills, whether from north or south, Simon could not say. What? he began to ask. Kantaka whined again and shook her head as though she did not like the sound in her ears. The troll raised his small brown hand and listened a moment more, then shouldered his bag again, beckoning Simon to follow him toward the murky break front of the forest. Hounds! I am thinking, he said. The wolf trotted around them in erratic ovals, moving close and then bounding out again. I think they are far away, still, south of the hills, uh, upon the frost march. The sooner we are entering the forest, though, the better. Perhaps, Simon said, making good time as he strode along beside the little man who was going at a near trot. But they didn't sound like any hounds that I've heard. That, Binibic grunted, is my thought also, and it is also why we are going quickly as we can. As he thought about what Binibic had said, Simon felt a cold hand clutch his innards. Stop, he said, and did. What are you doing, the little man hissed. They are still far behind, but call Kentaka. Simon stood patiently. Binibic stared at him for a moment, then whistled for the wolf, who was already trotting back. I hope that you will soon explain, the troll began, but Simon pointed at Kantaka. Ride her. Go on now, get up. If we need to hurry, I can run, but your legs are too short. Simon, Binibic said, anger crinkling his eyes. I was running on the slender ridges of Mintahok when I had only baby years. But this is flat ground and downhill. Please, Binibic, you said we needed to go quickly. The troll stared at him for a moment, then turned and clucked at Kantaka, who sank to her stomach in the sparse grass. Binibic threw a leg over her broad back and pulled himself into place using the thick fur of her hackles for a pommel. He clucked again, and the wolf rose, front feet and then hind, Binibic swaying on her back. Umu, Kantaka, he snapped. She started forward. Simon lengthened his pace and began to lope beside them. 
They could hear no sound now beside the noise of their own passage, but the memory of the distant howling made the back of Simon's neck prickle, and the dark face of Aldhort looked more and more like the welcoming smile of a friend. Binibic leaned low over Kantaka's neck, and for a long time would not meet Simon's eye. Side by side, they ran down the long slope. At last, as the flat gray sun was tipping down toward the hills behind them, they reached the first line of trees, a cluster of slim birches, pale serving girls ushering visitors into the house of their dark old master. Although the downs outside were bright with slanting sunlight, the companions found themselves passing quickly into twilight gloom as the trees rose above them. The soft forest floor cushioned their footfalls, and they ran silently as ghosts through the sparse outer woods. Columns of light speared down through the branches, and the dust of their passage rose behind them to hang sparkling between the shadows. Simon was tiring rapidly, sweat running down his face and neck in dirty rivulets. Farther, we must go, Benebic called to him from the pitching platform of Kantaka's back. Soon enough the way will be too tangled for speed, and the light too dim. Then we will rest. Simon said nothing, but only dug on, his breath burning in his lungs. When the boy slowed at last to an unsteady canter, Binibic slipped down from the wolf's back and ran at his side. The angling sun was sliding up the tree trunks around them, the forest floor darkening even as the upper branches took on shining halos like the colored windows of the Hayholtz chapel. At last, as the ground before them disappeared in darkness, Simon tripped over a half-buried stone. When Binibic caught him up at the elbow, he held on. Sit, now, the troll said. Simon slid to the ground without a word, feeling the loose soil give slightly beneath him. A moment later, Kantaka circled back. After sniffing the immediate area, she sat down and began to lick the perspiration from the back of Simon's neck. It tickled, but Simon was too exhausted to do much of anything about it. Binibic crouched on his haunches, examining their stopping place. They were partway down a small slope, at the bottom of which snaked a muddy stream bed with a dark trickle of water at its center. When you are uh, again breathing, he said, I think we might be moving just there. With his finger, he indicated a spot slightly uphill where a great oak stood, its tangle of roots warding off the encroachment of other trees so that there was a stone's throw of clear ground on all sides of its massive gnarled trunk. Simon nodded, still laboring for breath. After a while, he dragged himself to his feet and moved with the little man up the slope to the tree. Do you know where we are? Simon asked as he sank down to place his back against one of the looping, half-buried roots. No, said Binibic cheerfully, but tomorrow, when the sun is up and I have time for doing certain things, then I will. Now help me find some stones and sticks and we will be having a bit of fire. And later, Binibic rose from his crouch and began foraging for dead wood in the fast-fading daylight. Later, there will be a pleasant surprise for you. Binibic had built a sort of three-sided box of stones around the fire pit to shield its light, but still it crackled in a most heartening manner. The red gleam cast odd shadows as Binibic rooted in his bag. Simon watched a few lonely sparks spiral upward. They had made themselves a meager dinner of dried fish, hard cakes, and water. Simon did not feel he had treated his stomach as well as he would have liked, but it was still better to be lying here, warming the dull ache in his legs, than to be running. He could not remember a time when he had ever run so long or so far without stopping. Pa! Binibic chortled, lifting his firelight-tinted face from his bag in triumph. A surprise I was promising you, Simon, and a surprise I have. A pleasant surprise, you said. I've had enough of the other kind to last for my whole life. 
Binibic grinned, his round face seeming to stretch back toward his ears. Very well, it is for you to decide. Have a try of this. He handed Simon a small ceramic jar. What is it? Simon held it up to the fire. It felt solid, but the jar had no markings. Some troll thing? Open it. Simon stuck his finger into the top and found it was sealed with something that felt like wax. He scraped a hole through, then brought it to, up to his nose for a tentative sniff. A moment later, he pushed his finger in, pulled it out, and stuck it in his mouth. Jam, he said, delighted. Made from grapes, I am sure, Binibic said, pleased by Simon's response. Some I found at the abbey. But the excitement of late had driven it from my mind. After eating several dollops, Simon reluctantly passed it to Binibic, who also found it rather pleasant. Within a short while, they had finished it off, leaving Kantaka, the sticky jar, to lick. Simon curled himself in his cloak beside the warm stones of the dying fire. Could you sing a song, Binibic? he asked. Or tell a story? The troll looked over. I am thinking not a story, Simon, for we need to sleep and rise early. Perhaps a short song? That would be fine. But after thinking again, Binibic said, his, tugging his hood up around his ears, I would like to be hearing you sing a song. A uh, quiet singing, of course. Me? A song? Simon pondered. Through a chink in the trees, he thought he could see the faint glimmer of a star. A star. Well, then, he said, since you sang your song for me about Seda and the blanket of stars, I, I suppose I can sing one that the chambermaids taught me when I was a child. He moved around a bit, making himself more comfortable. I hope I remember all the words. It's a funny song. In the old heart's deep dell, Simon began softly, Jack Munwo did yell to his men of the woods near and far. He offered a crown and the forests renowned to the one who could catch him a star. Bairnoth stood first time and he shouted, I'll climb to the top of the highest of trees and I'll snatch that star down for the fair golden crown that will soon belong only to me. So he climbed up a birch to the highest high perch, then he leaped to an old tall yew. But as much as he jumped, and he leaped, and he bumped, reached the star that he never could do. Next, Gay Osgal stood, and he promised he would loose an arrow up into the sky. I will knock that star free, so it falls down to me, and the crown will be mine by and by. Twenty arrows he shot, not a single one caught, on the star that hung mocking above. As the arrows fell back, Osgal hid behind Jack, who chuckled and gave him a shove. Now all the men sought, and they quarreled and fought, and they had not a pinch of success, till the fair Ruza rose, and she looked down her nose at the men as she smoothed out her dress. "'Tis a small enough task for Jack Mundwode to ask," she said with a gleam in her eye. "'But if none of you here hold a gold crown so dear, I will seek Mundwode's knot to untie." Then she took up a net, which she bade the men get, and she cast it full into the lake. So the water did roil, and it almost did spoil the reflection the bright star did make. But then after a while, she turned round with a smile, said to Jack, Do you see what's about? It is there in my net, all caught up and quite wet. If you want it, then you pull it out. Old Jack laughed, and he shouted to all those who crowded, Here's the woman I must take to wife, for she's taken my crown, 
and she's brought my star down, so I might as well give her my life. Yes, she's taken the crown, and she's brought the star down, so Jack Mundwode has took her to wife. From the darkness he could hear Binnabit laugh, quietly and easily. A song of enjoyment, Simon, thanks to you. Soon the hissing of the embers quieted, and the only sound was the soft breathing of the wind through the endless trees. Before he opened his eyes, he was aware of a strange droning noise rising and falling close to where he lay. He lifted his head, feeling sticky with sleep, to see Binnabik sitting cross-legged before the fire. The sun had not been up long. The forest around them was draped in tendrils of pale mist. Binnabik had carefully placed a circle of feathers around the fire pit, feathers of many different birds as though he had scavenged them from the surrounding woods. Eyes closed, he leaned toward the small fire and chanted in his native language the sound that had pulled Simon to wakefulness. Tutusik ayuk chuyuk kachimak. Tutusik ayuk chuyuk kachimak. On and on he went. The slender ribbon of smoke that rose from the campfire began to waver as though in a strong breeze, but the tiny feathers lay flat on the ground, unmoving. With his eyes still closed, the troll began to move the palm of his hand in a flat circle over the fire. The ribbon of smoke bent as though pushed and began to stream steadily away across one corner of the pit. Binnabik opened his eyes and looked for a moment at the smoke then stopped the circling movement of his small hand. A moment later, the smoke resumed its normal motion. Simon had been holding his breath. He let it out. Do you know where we are now? He asked. Binnabik turned and smiled, pleased. Morning greetings. Yes, I think I am knowing to a nicety. We should be having little trouble, but much walking to get to Jaloy's house. House? Simon asked. A house in the Aldhort? What's it like? Ah. Binnabik straightened his legs and rubbed at his calves. It is not like any house you... He stopped and sat staring over Simon's shoulder, transfixed. The youth whirled in alarm, but there was nothing to see. What is it? Hush. Binnabik continued to gaze out. There! Are you hearing? After a moment, he did hear it. The distant baying they had marked in their journey across the downs to the forest. Simon felt his skin crawl. The hounds! Again! he said. But it sounds as though they're still far away. You are not understanding yet. Binnabik looked down at the fire pit, then up at the morning light bleeding down through the treetops. They have passed us in the night. They have run all night. And now, unless my ears are playing tricks at me, they have turned back toward us. Whose hounds? Simon felt his palms go moist with sweat and rubbed them on his cloak. Are they following us? They can't hunt us in the forest, can they? Benedict scattered the feathers with a scuff of his small boot and began packing his shoulder bag. I do not know, he said. I am not knowing the answer to any of those questions. There is power in the forest that might confuse hunting hounds, ordinary hounds. It is doubtful, however, that any local baron out for sport would be running his dogs through all the night, and I have not heard of dogs that could do so. Binnabit called Kentaka. Simon sat up and hurriedly pulled his boots on. He felt sore all over and now felt sure he would be running again. It's Elias, isn't it? He said grimly, wincing as he pushed his blistered foot down into the boot heel. Perhaps. Kentaka trotted up and Binnabek threw a leg over her back. But what is making a doctor's helper so important to him? And where is the king finding hounds that can run twenty leagues between dusk and sunrise. Binnabik put the pack on Kantaka's shoulders before him 
and handed Simon his walking stick. Do not lose this, please. I wish we had found a horse for your riding. The pair started down the slope to the gully, then up the far side. Are they close? Simon asked. How far is this house? Neither house nor hounds are nearby, Benedict said. Well, I shall be running beside you as soon as Kantaka is tiring. Kick us with, he swore. How I am wishing for a horse. Me too, Simon panted. They trekked on through the morning, eastward into deeper forest. As they went up and down the, ro the rocky dells, the baying behind them faded for long minutes, then returned, seemingly louder than ever. As good as his word, Binibic jumped down from Kantaka when the wolf began to flag and trotted along beside, his short legs carrying him two steps for Simon's every one, his teeth bared as his cheeks puffed in and out. They stopped to drink water and rest as the sun neared mid-morning. Simon tore strips from his two packages to bandage his blistered heels, then handed the bundles to Binibic so he could put them in the pack. Simon could no longer stand to feel them rattling against his thigh as he walked and ran. As they sloshed the last musky drops from the water bag in their cheeks and tried to regain their straining breath, the sounds of pursuit came up again. This time, the unmistakable clamor of the hounds was so much nearer that they immediately lurched into motion once more. Within a short while, they began to ascend a long rise. The ground was becoming increasingly rocky as it mounted upward, and even the types of trees seemed to be changing. Staggering up the hilly slope, Simon felt a sickening sense of defeat spread through his body like poison. Binibic had told him it would be late in the afternoon, or at, le at least before they reached this Jaloy, yet they were already losing the race, with the sun not risen to noon above the sheltering trees. The noise of their pursuers was constant, an excited howling so loud that Simon could not help wondering, even as he stumbled up the daunting slope, where they found the breath to run and bark at once. What kind of hounds were they? Simon's heart beat as fast as a bird's wings. He and the troll would get to face the hunters soon enough. The thought made him feel sick. At last, a slender patch of sky could be seen through the standing trunks on the horizon the top of the rise. They limped past the final line of trees. Kantaka, who ran before them, stopped abruptly and barked, a sharp, high-pitched sound from deep in her throat. Simon! Benebic shouted, and threw himself to the ground, knocking the boy's legs from beneath him, so he tumbled down with a huff of punched-out breath. When the black tunnel of Simon's vision widened a moment later, he was lying on his elbows, looking down a craggy rock face into a deep canyon. A cluster of fragments broke loose from the stone beneath his hand and hopped and tumbled down the sheer wall to disappear into the green treetops far below. The baying was like the brazen flare of war trumpets. Simon and the troll edged themselves away from the canyon's edge, a few feet back down the slope, and stood. Look, Simon hissed, his bleeding hands and chin of no import now. Pinnipic, look! He pointed back down the long slope they had just climbed, through the clinging blanket of trees. Passing in and out of the clearings, far, far less than half a league behind, was a flurry of low, white shapes the hounds. Binibic took his stick from Simon and twisted it into halves. He shook out his darts and handed the knife end to Simon. Quickly, he said, cut yourself a tree branch, a cudgel. If selling our lives we must be, let us keep the price high. The throaty voices of the dogs boiled up the hillside, a rising song of the closing and the kill. Chapter 25, The Secret Lake. He hacked and chipped frantically, bending the limb down with his full weight, the knife slippery in his trembling fingers. It took Simon many costly seconds to cut loose a branch that would suit him, 
pathetic defense though it would be, and every second brought the hounds nearer. The limb that he finally snapped off was as long as his arm, knobbed at one end where another branch had fallen away. The troll was rummaging in his backpack, one hand clutching the heavy fur at Kantaka's neck. Hold her, he called to Simon. If she is let go now, she will attack too soon. They will drag her down and, and be quickly killing her. Simon crouched with an arm around the wolf's broad neck. She was trembling with excitement, heart beating beneath his arm. Simon felt his own heart speeding in tandem. This was all so unreal. Just this morning, he and Binibic had been sitting calmly beside the fire. The cry of the pack intensified. They came surging up the hill like white termites fleeing a crumbling nest. Kantaka lunged forward, dragging Simon to his knees. Hinikaya! Binibic shouted and flicked at her nose with his hollow bone tube, then dropped it as he pulled a length of rope from the bottom of his bag and began to make a noose. Simon, thinking he understood, looked over the canyon's edge behind them and shook his head despairingly. It was much too far to the bottom, more than twice as far as Binibic's rope could reach down the sheer rock face. Then he saw something and felt hope, still struggling inside him. Binibic, look, he pointed. The troll, despite the impossibility of a climb down, was looping his rope around a stump anchored not a yard from the canyon's edge. As he finished, he looked up to follow Simon's pointing finger. Less than a hundred paces from where they crouched, a huge old hemlock lay tipped downward. Its bottom edge, its bottom end balanced on the near lip. The tip lodged halfway down the far canyon wall, caught on a jutting ledge. We can climb down it. We can climb across to the far side, Simon said. But the troll shook his head. If we climb down it with Kantaka, then they can be doing it as well. And it goes to nowhere, he gestured. The ledge where the tree had caught was no more than a wide shelf in the rock face. But it will be some help. He stood up and tugged at the rope, testing the knot around the stump. Take Kantaka down onto it, if you can. Not far, perhaps ten, ten cubits only. Hold her until I am calling. Understood. But, Simon began, then looked back down the slope. The white shapes, perhaps a dozen in all, were almost upon them. He grabbed the balking Kantaka by the scruff of the neck and urged her toward the fallen hemlock. Enough of the tree had remained on the canyon's edge that there was space between the twisting roots and the rock rim. It was not easy to keep balance while clinging to the wolf. She shivered and pulled back, growling. The noise was almost subsumed in the clamor of the approaching hounds. He could not coax her up onto the broad trunk and turned to Binibic in despair. Omu! the troll called hoarsely, and a moment later she jumped up onto the hemlock, still growling. Simon straddled the trunk as best he could, his club a hindrance in his belt. He slid backward on his rump, keeping a grip on Kantaka until he was well out from the canyon's rim. Just then the troll cried out and Kantaka whirled toward the sound of his voice. Simon hung on to her neck with both arms as his knees gripped the rough bark. He was suddenly cold, so cold. He lowered his face into her fur smelled her thick, wild smell, and whispered a prayer. Alicia, mother of our ransomer, give mercy, protect us. Binibic was standing with a coil of rope in his hand, just a step before the rim. Hinik Kantaka, he called, and then the hounds were out of the trees and up the final slope. Simon could not really see much of them from where he sat holding the straining wolf, only long, thin, white backs and sharp ears. The beasts moved toward the troll at a gallop, making a noise like metal chains dragged on a slate floor. What is Binibic doing? Simon thought, panic making it hard for him to breathe. Why doesn't he run? Why doesn't he use his darts? Something. It was like the recurrence of his worst nightmare, like Morgenes in flames standing between Simon and the deadly hand of Elias. 
He couldn't sit and watch Binibic killed before his eyes. As he started to pull himself forward, the dogs leaped toward the troll. Simon had only a moment's impression of long, pale snouts, of empty, pearl-white eyes, and a flare of red curving tongues and red mouths. Then Binibig jumped backward, down into the canyon. No! Simon shrieked, horrified. The five or six creatures that had been nearest lunged forward, unable to stop, and tumbled over the cliff in a squealing tangle of white legs and tails. Helpless, Simon watched the clot of whinnying dogs bounce against the steep rock face and plummet down into the trees far below with an explosive popping of broken branches. He felt another choking scream rise in his breast. Now, Simon, let her go! Mouth agape, Simon looked down to see Binibic's feet braced against the canyon wall, the troll hanging suspended from the rope about his waist not two dozen feet below the spot where he had jumped. Let her go, he called again, and Simon finally uncurled his restraining arm from Kentaka's neck. The remainder of the hounds were milling at the rim above Binibic's head, sniffing the ground and staring down, barking savagely at the little man who hung so frustratingly near. As Kantaka made her cautious way back up the hemlock's broad back, one of the white hounds turned tiny eyes like fogged mirrors toward the tree, and Simon then let out a great rasping snarl as he hurried forward. The other quickly followed. Before the yammering pack reached the hemlock, the gray wolf negotiated the last steps, reaching the rim with a magnificent leap. The first dog was on her in a heartbeat, two more right behind. The snarling battle song of the wolf rose, a deeper note among the barking and howling of the hounds. Simon, frozen for a moment of indecision, began inching forward toward the edge of the rim. The trunk was so broad that his spread legs ached and he considered getting up to his knees to crawl forward, sacrificing his clutch on the tree for speed. For the first time, he turned his gaze straight down. The tops of the trees were a bumpy green carpet far below. The distance was dizzying, much farther than the leap from the wall to Green Angel Tower. His head reeled, and he looked away, deciding to keep his knees right where they were. As he looked up, a white shape bounded from the canyon's edge onto the wide hemlock. The hound growled and drove forward, talons catching at the bark. Simon had only an instant to pull out his knotted branch before the beast crossed the dozen or so feet and dove for his throat. For a moment the branch caught in his belt, but he had pushed it in narrow end down, which saved his life. As the club came free, the dog was upon him. Yellow teeth gleamed as it bit at his face. He got the branch up high enough to strike a glancing blow, turning the dog's lunge so that the teeth snapped on air an inch below, an inch from his left ear, spraying him with saliva. Its paws were on his chest, and the awful carrion stench of its breath blew in his face. He was losing his hold. He tried to pull the club back up, but it caught between the animal's extended front legs. He leaned back as the long, snarling muzzle once more snaked toward his face and tried to twist the branch free. There was a moment of resistance, then one of the white hound's paws was knocked from his shoulder and the beast overbalanced. It squealed and tumbled away, scrabbling for a moment at the bark, then pulling the club from his hand as it slid from the tree trunk to fall end over end down into the canyon. Simon sank forward, catching at the tree with his hands and coughed, trying to drive the fetid breath of the thing out of his nostrils. He was cut short by a low growl. He lifted his head slowly to see another hound standing on the log just below the roots, milky eyes glinting like a blind beggar's. It bared its teeth in a frothing, crimson-tongued grin. Simon hopelessly lifted his empty hands as the beast padded slowly down the trunk, ropey muscles bunching beneath the short fur. The hound turned to nip at its flank, worrying the skin for a moment, 
then returned its eerie, vacant gaze to Simon. It took another step, wobbled, took one shaky step more, then folded in place to slide off the hemlock into oblivion. The black dart seemed the safest, Finnebick called. The little man stood a few yards down slope from the tree's ball of dried roots. A moment later, Kantaka limped up to stand at his side, her muzzle dripping with dark red blood. Simon stared, slowly realizing that they had survived. Go slowly now, the troll cried. Here I will throw the rope. It would be bad sense to lose you after all we were going through. The rope arced out and fell slithering across the log where Simon sat. He took it gratefully, his hand shaking as though with palsy. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight. Pretty exciting stuff, huh? Um, I remember writing that. I really, I, that came back to me as I was working on it. I remember um, writing a lot of these scenes um, and where I was when I was doing it, which was my old house in Redwood City um, for that particular scene anyway. Um, I remember writing uh, the whole climactic underground scene in Tail Chaser while uh, working as the manager at an art supply place um, one night and just left the art class to do their thing and retreated into the office with my typewriter and uh, wrote the entire climactic uh, Tail Chaser song scene. Not climactic like the end of the book, but climactic like the big um, exciting, you know, everything blowing up underground scene. And I remember writing that one in my, uh, what used to be the, the second bedroom, um, which is where it was I used as an office um, until I actually had an office, which sadly I only had for like a couple of months and then I got divorced <laughs> and lost my house and my office. Anyway, um, so we are done for the night. I thank you very much for joining me and running a little bit over uh, time, but that's okay because I talked and talked and talked at the beginning. I will be back next week. Um, same Tad time, same Tad channel. Seven, well, 1 a.m. Sunday and then again 7 p.m. Sunday, this particular slot. Until then, please take good care of yourselves. Take good care of your friends and loved ones. Help people out when you can, and we will all get through these things together. So, and hello to all the people who showed up later in the broadcast and I didn't get a chance to say hello to, including Chris and who else? I see other people here. Um, 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 Steve, hola, buddy, good to see you. And Willer Jean, Willer June Araneta Manares from the Philippines, excellent. So, and if I missed anybody else, uh, I apologize, but good to see you all. Thank you for joining me. And I will see you again next week. So, peace, good night, and looking forward to seeing you soon.